So lots of talk about bouncing back, seeing a reaction, putting things right, but it all came to nothing, really. Uh, a dreadful home defeat to a team in the bottom three today. Glenn, same as last week, really. Where do we start with this? It was disastrous. Um, it was very, very poor. Um, we've, we've gone from looking like a team that you know, was playing well enough to push for a Europa League place to looking like a team that <laughs> the season started a week ago, we'd be thinking we're going to get relegated this year. Mm. We've, we've been that bad in the last two games. Um, I think today was, I think we, yeah, we'll get onto the Newcastle game. There was a certain amount of inevitability about losing that one, but, but today we should not have, you know, we should not have lost to Watford. Um, but we, we made them look like prime Brazil at times. Uh, we just we just weren't on it. They, they, want, they want enough hard work. They want enough closing down. There was certainly not enough urgency, especially in the second half. Um, and we were lucky to still be in the game at half time. to be honest. Mm. To, to go in 2-1 down was a right result because, it, honestly, if, if Watford hadn't butchered a couple of openings that they had when they... They seemed to be constantly breaking four on three. And l luckily... Um, Emmanuel Dennis, who was the, the striker that I picked out as being the main threat, had a, had a shocker and just kept choosing the wrong pass and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah, to, to, to get to half time, just the 2 1 down was reasonable, but the um, the kind of expected cavalry charge in the second half just didn't really materialize. We had a couple of half openings, but never really, you know, for my money, looked like scoring. And, mm. um, yeah, and that was it. that was it. It was just it was just poor. But you you can't give away goals like we've started to give away the last few weeks and expect to win games against anybody. And I think that's been uh, that's been proved both against Newcastle and today. Vanessa, who's watching on Facebook, says, "I also missed today's match due to COVID, and I'm actually slightly relieved as well." So uh, thank you for uh, thanks for watching, Vanessa. Thank you for the comment. Uh, ben, what did you make of it all today? Yeah, I think the word that I've seen around a lot, and I'd, I'd written down at the top of my notes here, Martin, frustrating. Um, I, I agree with what Glenn said. It, it, you know, it could have been more. I think we were sort of grateful in the end that it was two one. I think second half, you know, they had probably more opportunities than than we did, and we'd made the right sub at at, uh, at half time. Arguably, that potentially should have been the starting lineup. I know there was a lot of chat after the West Ham game and Hazen Hootal effectively getting it right. Maybe there was questions today about his lineup, which I'm sure we'll come on to, but. I just I thought it was all a bit one paced, you know. As Glenn said, we never really looked like scoring. I thought we were really sloppy, particularly that first goal, the sort of thing you'll see down Riverside Park a lot on a Sunday morning. And uh, just I, I, it just felt like they were really casual. It's almost like they turned up thinking Watford are in the bottom three, we'll be fine. We can go through the motions and we'll get a win here. And it never happened. And uh, you know, as I said, I think even in the second half, Fraser Forster arguably had more to do than Ben Foster, which was really frustrating. I thought. And as I say, I think that's the the word that kind of sums it up. Uh, ben, who's watching on Facebook, says uh, all the hard work over December, January and February has been undone and we looked bang average again. Um, Nick, is that um, was that a display today just to prove that we are kind of back where we were and perhaps we got a little bit carried away with with the run of good results? No, uh, I, I'm going to be a lot more optimistic and, and glass half full about what's happened this week because I didn't think we were that terrible uh, against Newcastle, uh, which we'll come on to later uh, today. Um, it, the first half was just abysmal. I mean, Salisu clearly is is not quite back on it. He was back on it later in the first half and the second half. But in the 11th minute, he made an error that let, let Yao Pedro shot free in front of goal. And it was only that great Bednarak block that stopped it being 1-0 then. And then Forster screwed up with his pass, you know, effectively to, to, a, to a player. Salisu played a hospital pass back under hit. That's 1-0. 2-0, defenders, AWOL, uh, Perot was covering the centre because no one else was there, which meant that um, uh, uh, Hernandez managed to get behind him instead of being where in position. So that's, you know, 2-0, it, it's a disaster. Um, and then, obviously, the Elanusi goal, goal at half-time. So the second half was fine, yeah, it was a bit meh, it wasn't terrible. We, we were sort of... Uh, again, like against Newcastle, we were wasting chances, but um, but I don't think it it sets us back to sort of pre December from Boxing Day, the three two at West Ham, when suddenly Southampton have a backbone. You know, suddenly for the first time in ages, we are coming from behind to win a game, and then throughout the rest of December, January, and February, you know, we're seeing certainly the Tottenham game, the three two at Tottenham. That's the best. I don't know about you guys, but that's the best Southampton performance yeah. I've seen in five six years, maybe since. Certainly since um, Kuman era, Pochettino, and I think 
if you look across the whole piece, you don't just, this doesn't take us back to where we were. I think there are other reasons about what happened at Newcastle and what happened today. For me, today was hugely about complacency. It was also about Ralph overthinking it again. Will Spallbone probably shouldn't have started, you know. Um, the Newcastle game was a bit complacency and a bit the fact that Newcastle were desperate for the points much more than we were because we are effectively safe. So, mm. so no, we're not, we're not back to pre Boxing Day, uh, for my money. Very disappointing. Three defeats in a row is absolutely terrible. We're not taking our chances. But today was about complacency, as was Newcastle. And I still think there are reasons to be optimistic. One, we're not in a relegation fight. Two, there's still a, something to play for this season. We're, you know, Chances are we won't beat Man City, but we could. The FA Cup is still alive as a trophy chance. Three, before the Aston Villa defeat, there were some serious suggestions that Manchester United had Ralph on their list. Mm. I don't. I'm, I'm still fully behind Ralph. I think next season, in a non-COVID season, with with the ground and his squad and and the new owners coming in, that actually, you know, I'm optimistic about next season already. And 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 I think the chances of Ralph going have diminished because we've lost three games <laughs> in a row. So I'm definitely half glass full on that. And four, you know, we've got the new owners. I'm, I'm optimistic to see what they're doing. We're not like. The owners, you know, of the two clubs involved at Stamford Bridge today and, and all that sort of uh, malarkey, you know. So, no, we're not back to square one. And it's been a bad week. Terrible first half today. Mayor against Newcastle and Aston Villa was. I didn't see it. I listened to it. It was a hard listen. But, mm. but I, I still see overall there is progress there. That's my take. Nick, we're not used to this optimism on the podcast. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> well, well, look, I am I am a Saints fan, so I've been I've been there and I've done it through all the years. But I do think there is something about this group of players. That Tottenham performance, more than anything, made me think, uh, made me sort of just very very hopeful. And what it also told us is the eleven who started that day and then started against Manchester United, which I think now there's a consensus that that is our best 11. Mm. Although I think there's an interesting debate to be had about um, about um, uh, Liveramento and whether um, Walker Peters should be starting on the right and Perot on the left. And we can get into that a bit later if you want. But that 11 is a good 11 when they're all firing and they're all fit and they haven't had COVID and they have, they're not coming back from knock. So on our best day with the best players playing, that's a good, good team. And I think that's reason for optimism. But we also have to accept that Sally Sue is going to be out and they're not quickly get back to it. That Brozier might go off the pace for a bit, as he did against Newcastle. That Livramento, he has dropped off markedly in the last half a dozen games compared to, say, the first 10 games of the season. So, yeah, we, there are reasons for optimism. And I think we should be... I don't think we... I'm not saying we have to focus on that. I'm just saying I prefer to think that there's, there's a lot of good stuff happening from ownership down to pitch level that we can still be optimistic about d despite a terrible set of three results that we've just had. Yeah. And Glenn, we've kind of learned not to criticise the team selection and we had to bite our tongues a bit today. But to start with just one recognised striker against Watford did raise a few eyebrows, didn't it? Um, Perot and Smallbone coming in for, for Liveramento and, and Brogia. Yeah. I mean, Brogia's dropped off the last, you know, the last few weeks. He's He's... No, he's not looked he's not looked very lively maybe he's just tired but um and after the newcastle game when adam armstrong actually did okay when he came on um i don't think many people would have been surprised to see brozier left out this game and and armstrong play um uh, i agree with nick about ralph overthinking it because i to put will smallbone in the team ahead of adam armstrong or even shane long it was was a real left field shout which must have been based on something seen on the training ground now will smallbone we tried him as a like a number six defensive player doesn't work too lightweight we tried him sort of in that sort of central number 10 role if you like just off the main striker that's never worked before either and again it's it's probably down to physicality he, in our in our system he only seems to be suitable for playing in the wide positions so i don't i don't understand the the need to try and shoehorn him into the team the, in that position um, centrally. The the other issue it caused today is that, well, one, he hardly touched the ball in the first half. He just seemed to be chasing it around the whole time. And Chay Adams likes to run the channels. And if you're running the channels and you're the only striker, that 
basically means there's no one in the no box. In and the that way. that seemed to be an issue in the first half. Now, to me, once I mean people might think it's harsh to haul you know, haul him off at half time. But to be honest, and, and fair play to, to Ralph for, for doing that because he realized he had to do something. To be honest, he could have hauled him off as soon as Watford went ahead because it was pretty obvious from that point on we were going to need all our sort of attacking resources, if you like, to get back into the game because we knew how Watford were going to play. They were just going to camp on the edge of their own box and go break us down because every team knows that we're not great when there's no, you know, no spacing behind. Um, and and so it proved. So, uh, yeah, it was a it was a strange team selection. Uh, and, I've you know, I, I will... I will say that it, it that you know Ralph got that wrong at the start, but at least he had um, at least he had it about him to change it at half time because yeah you know, on on one on one level at, at least it must have been quite a difficult thing to do. What did you make of the the changes, Ben? Because that was Will Smallbone's first Premier League appearance since December. I think did he do enough? Uh, evidence would suggest not. And, and when we set up, it would have worked okay had we got that first goal. Was that was that always going to be the key? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I, I think Will Smallbone is a very honest player. I think he, you know, he's young. I think we have to remember that. I think he, he he's someone that, as Glenn said, I think maybe it was the tactics that let him down today rather than his performance. Um, I totally agree. For me, you know, I was thinking through that that 30, 35 minute period, he could easily take him off now and bring on another striker because it was clear that that was the, the obvious change to make. Um, I just wanted to a touch on Brozier though, actually, because I, I saw quite a few people saying after the Newcastle game, you know, he had a shocker and things like that. And I think you kind of have to remember with him as well, you know, he is only 20 years old. Um, this is his first season in the Premier League. I think you also have to remember that there's been a lot going on at Chelsea the last few days. I think the Newcastle game was the same day as all the news came out about Chase, Chelsea. There's probably a lot going on in his head about where his future lies and things like that as well. So taking him out of the firing line maybe wasn't the, the, the a bad thing to do, Martin, but I think possibly... I would have gone with Adam Armstrong and given him a chance. I think he did well in the cup game the other day. Would have given them some energy up front as well. So, yeah, I do think Ralph got it wrong today. You know, we know that he got it right against West Ham. So, I suppose that's the life of a manager. Yeah. And yeah. and Nick, too, too many players just having an off day? Is that what we put it down to today? The likes of Romeo and, and Armstrong, you know, when they're on top of their game, they're, they're unplayable at times. But this week, it, it's not been a great week for, for some of them. Yeah, I mean... Forster, you know, he made he made um, he did make a couple of a couple of saves, but you know, in the fourteenth minute, when, I mean, what is he doing? And then what is Salisu doing? So, so Forster didn't have a good game. Um, uh, you could go through the team, Stu, because because of the way they set up, it was almost like Stu was, I don't know what he was thinking. Right, I now have to play a striking role rather than his normal game where he's like creative and supplying. So so obviously he was subpar because he was. You know things that were being expected of him. But shouldn't I didn't think Oriel had a terrible game, and I was actually quite concerned when he got taken off later. That that you know Ralph might end you know taking that one more pillar out of the defensive unit might actually let Watford you know increase their lead. Um, but yes, Morbone wasn't great. Uh, Broya again, he wasn't great. Yeah, there were there were subpar performances. Uh, across across the team and this is the thing when you've got our best 11 which we generally agree on on the pitch and they're all playing really well we can do stuff like Tottenham but when you've got just two or three of them subpar or we haven't got the 11 out there and two or three of the others are subpar we end up with results like Newcastle and uh, and today so uh, yeah I mean it's it's frustrating um, and I don't know I don't there's no easy solutions but I do think there is still opt hope there that we did have that period of consistency aside from that Wolves defeat in that run from Boxing Day to the end of February that that sort of give us that's the best consistency we've had in three years under under Ralph so mm -hmm. Yeah, And the other thing I just wanted to touch on as well, Martin, I'm fairly sure that Ralph has said before that Stuart Armstrong can't play three games in a week. Um, and to my knowledge, he has played 90 minutes three times this week. So yeah. I thought he looked I thought he looked off it today. You know, he is one of our most creative players. You need him to be on top of his game. So has there been a bit of mismanagement with him this week in the desperation to try and get points, arguably? And therefore, you know, it's almost had a knock on impact with him. And we've got that international break coming up as well soon, hasn't we? Which is uh, <laughs> it's never good when he comes back um, after some time away. Glenn, is it ironic that we just kind of we settled on our our best eleven or what we we've discussed it at length? We think it's our best eleven, and then um, it was always going to be that a few of them would would have subpar games, and and we we struggle. I think the point Ben made earlier on is about the 
relative youth of the team, you're always going to get inconsistent performances from young players. Mm. So, and you can certainly add Salasu into that as well. You know, he, he is only 22. He's had a, you know, he's obviously got a bit of a question mark over him injury wise. That might be playing on his mind a little bit. And, you know, he, he wasn't great today, but it, even the players that you think of as being a little bit more experienced, I think Perot's only 23, Walker Peters is only 24. It's not as if these are, you know, 29 year old, 30 year old hardened professionals. Um, I mean, well, Romeo's 30, isn't he? Um, you know, so he hasn't got that excuse for not having the greatest to go today. But uh, I can see, you know, and, and you have to remember as well, we are what we are. We're not, we're not a top six side for a reason. And this, this is one of the reasons is that we're never going to be consistent over 25 games. You know, the sort of run that a Manchester City or a Liverpool can put together. It's just, it's just not feasible to expect that. And that, and that unfortunately goes for the players. It also goes for the manager and it, it goes for the whole club, really. Even the fans, sometimes we're really up for it. And sometimes we're just, you know, sometimes it's, a, it's a little bit flat. So I think you just have to accept that that, that is the way we are and that is the way it will be sometimes as it is for most mid-table sides I mean I, I noticed that Aston Villa have gone above us in the, in the table now they've already sacked one manager this season and after mm-hmm. Gerrard's initial bounce they lost like four games in a row and and now they're now they're back to win you know picking up points again I think they lost today did they or yesterday but mm-hmm. uh you know so there are lots of ups and downs for for mid-table sides, but what we've got to guard against now is this going from three defeats in a row to five, six, seven defeats in a row, and th- and then you've you've got a problem. So, and that's the major disappointment about today because today was supposed to be the day to sort of nip it in the bud and uh, <laughs> and get go- get going again in the right direction, but it didn't happen. Mm-hmm. So it's got to happen in the next league game whenever that is. Any decent performances today, Ben? Any any positives to take away from that? I thought Carl Walker Peters had another great game. Yeah, I was trying to think of positives. The one positive I wrote down was that we played badly and lost. If we play well and lost, that would have been pretty depressing. But yeah, he was the only person I could really think of, Martin, that could could probably say he was a, a seven or eight out of ten. Ironically, probably the same in Newcastle game as well. It's it's you know, he's been very consistent the last few weeks. Um I think, you know, he is going back to Nick's point earlier, for me. Despite what happened today, I still think Carl Walker, Peters, and Perot are the more balanced fullbacks at the moment. Livermento was excellent before he got injured, but I think at the moment it's the right move to have Carl at uh, a right back. But yeah, I thought he was good getting forward today. A little bit frustrating, maybe that the the, the final ball wasn't there, which is unlike. Uh, unlike him, really. But um, I thought out of everyone on the pitch today, from a, a Saints point of view, I thought he was the standout. And Nick, we've had um, various discussions uh, on the pod over the last few weeks and months about the, um, the defensive partnerships and where the, the players fit in. What would your take be on Carl Walker-Peters, Perot, Livermento? How does that work best for you? Well, I was looking at the, the stats and, and the, the performances after the Newcastle game. So this is not including today. Perot's played 17 games, all competitions this season. Uh, he's only, and before today, he'd only be involved in four defeats, and that was away at Everton, Liverpool, Wolves, and Villa. So he had 70, whatever, 77% non losing, a winning or drawing. And and that's not bad, those, those are good. Incidentally, I'm pretty sure in, I'm right in saying today is the first time Saints have lost this season in any competition when Kyle Water Peters has played right back. <laughs> Because um, he'd only he'd he'd had seven losses out of twenty six appearances at all competitions uh, this season before today, and they were Wolves at home, uh, Chelsea away, Norwich away, Liverpool away, Arsenal away, Villa away, and Newcastle at home. Obviously, the other day, um, and he played uh, left back in all of those. Mm. So I, I was trying to work out, what you, you know, I was just sort of exploring. This issue of where does Livermento fit? Livermento had, had has had eight losses from twenty six games, which is the highest loss rate of of any of those three. And so for my money, I agree with Ben. I think I think Perot is our best left back. He's and and Walker Peters certainly since Livermento's gone off the boil after injury is our best right back. And but Carl Walker Peters plays really well, really consistently on either flank. But I kind of think our best pairing in terms of fullbacks is Kyle Walker Peters at the moment at right back and Perot at left back. But, yeah. you know, obviously Livermento did so well in the early part of the season when of course 
we didn't have a win in seven games, but he was shining in, in a team that wasn't getting the results. So that would be, and then centre-halves, I think it's pretty obvious. Salisu uh, should be the first name in the team sheet when he's back and recovered and probably with, with Bednarek. Do you think we've rushed Salisu back a bit too quickly, Ben? As, as fans, we were desperate to see him come back in, weren't we? I don't. I don't think so. I think you know we needed him back. I think last week at Villa kind of showed the hole that uh, he leaves behind. I think it just it just shows, doesn't it? You can't be off it in the Premier League against anyone. You know, anyone that if if you're a, a four, five, six out of ten, you know, other teams are going to take advantage of that. And yeah, he was poor today. The, the last hour of the game, he was probably a lot better. But that first half an hour, he, he, you know, he's one of those players we know. He's he's very relaxed on the ball, and sometimes he's too relaxed. You know, and sometimes he takes chances that he shouldn't take, and plays out when it's easier to play back and things like that. But I mean, that first goal today, it's it's just the old school, isn't it? If in doubt, just lump it. You know, and he didn't do that. And uh, uh, you know, everyone makes mistakes. I think we realise that. You know, as as you, we've said on the pod before, you know, we haven't got fifty, sixty, seventy million pound Van Dykes at the back anymore. So you have to realise that that's part of his development. But for me, I think we needed him back, and I'm surprised that he's kind of. Um, being involved the way he has the last couple of games. And maybe it does just show that you can't drop out for a few games and then naturally come back in and get up to speed straight away. And Glenn, should we have got anything out of that? I know there was the penalty shout at the end, wasn't there? And, and VAR got involved, but if it, there wasn't much in that, really. Um, well, it's an interesting one because I'm sure there's been one, one interpretation of the handball rule over the last couple of years where that probably would have been given as a penalty because at the end of the day, his arms were up and the mm. ball hit his arm. He was actually facing away the other way. Mm. So if he'd been facing, the, you know, towards the ball, I do think it probably would have been given because his arms were up above his head. Um, so it'd be hard to argue that he did it deliberately, but who knows what the rule is these days anyway. Um, I mean, it's one of those ones, I think if they said to the referee, go and look at it and then slowed it down, they may well have they may well have given it, but, but they didn't do that. To be honest we didn't deserve anything out of the game anyway. If we'd been given it, it would have been an absolute travesty. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, it, it, we're, you know, so to, to be honest, I have no problem with that not being given. Yeah, it would have been very harsh. I mean, it, it, you know, he didn't, he didn't, he, like you said, he had his back to it. He didn't know where the ball was. It, it hit him quite high on the arm. It wasn't deliberate. Clearly, it would have been very yeah. harsh on Watford. He'd have to be one of those... Yeah, he'd have to be some sort of criminal mastermind to work <laughs> out that I'm going to jump with my arms and not face the ball like this. And it was it was one of those here. days as well, wasn't it? Where I think that was like the 90th minute, and they just kept showing replays, and they were almost like teasing you, and you knew they weren't going to give it because it was one of those days. But yeah, I mean, for me, I didn't think it was a penalty. But as Glenn says, you don't know what a handball penalty is these days, anyway. So no, that's uh, that's very true. A um, couple of comments from Ralph afterwards, Ben. One was. Um, not our highest level with the ball and not our highest level against the ball, which um, kind of like sums up the day, really. Um, but he was also talking about the the time wasting from a team like Watford. Is that something we need to get better at? Because the, the authorities aren't going to stamp down on that, do they? We need to just not get as frustrated. No, I, I think the emphasis is on on us, Martin. We, we've allowed them to do that by giving them soft goals. You know, you know what teams are going to do away from home. Newcastle did it the other night. You let them go ahead. They're going to roll around they're gonna take time out of the game we've done it over the years you know ryan bertrand was king of doing that oh, for, yeah, for yeah. saints for for many a time so I, I i think it's easy to kind of blame other teams when that happens to you but actually if you give them the chance to do that you know they're gonna they're gonna take advantage of it so that's football in this day and age and we just need to to suck that one up i'm afraid i made the yeah. most of it yeah i'll I, I tell you what though if, if if i could wish for one thing for next year that referees to do is start booking players for time wasted in the, in the mm. first half. Don't just mm -hmm. leave it to the 85th minute. If they're mm. doing it from the 30th minute onwards, then... then That's always them. happened though, Glenn, hasn't it? I mean, yeah. goalkeepers, oh, they, always, they yeah, time waste and then they get a yellow card in the 89th minute or something, yeah. as you say. But no, you're right, you're but, spot on, you're spot on. There was a lad who was playing for Northern Ireland who managed to get two bookings for time wasting um, in the first half. And th there was hell about it because how can you send someone off for time wasting in the first half? Well, he deserved it. You know, they were they were playing for a nil-nil draw from the first minute, and he. So I would I would like to see. I'm not suggesting for a second that that you know it's not a sour grapes thing for what's happened the last couple of days. I'm a boring Martin. He's wandered <laughs> off, but um, I forgot to plug my laptop in. <laughs> oh, that's all right, mate. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I I would like to see it because you know if you think about it, forget Saints for a second. It it's an end. It's you know it's supposed to be entertainment. And it, it ain't entertaining to have players rolling around from the, 
you know, from the from the start of the game and only seeing about 50 minutes of actual play or whatever it is. It, it is something that's frustrating, but it's not going to change anytime soon, as, as Ben said. But it, w- it would be nice if it did. I'll tell you what wasn't time-wasting was, was the Brozier injury. I, I mean, the mm. shot that we got of his eye at the end, mm. I mean, it was bleeding. Mm. And tomorrow morning, his face is going to be mm. up like a, you know, a smash pumpkin. It, well, that looked we, properly we were, we were losing at the time, so it's not exactly going to be time wasted. Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. It looked nasty. Mm. Yeah. Not, deliberate, not deliberate. Not deliberate. 